Well, as I said, I want to talk to you a little bit more about Gypsy and how uh, Julie Stein created one of the most important scores in the uh, American musical theater. You know, he was not originally the first choice to put that piece together. Um, as we said, uh, it would have been a Stephen Sondheim piece throughout, but Ethel Merman had just done another show called Happy Hunting that was a disaster and uh, with an untried new songwriter, and she said, I'm tired of new people, I want an established person. They went to Cole Porter, and he told them no. And they went to Irving Berlin, and he told them no. And they went to Richard Rogers, and he told them no. And after all of those people told them no, they found Julie Stein, who, as I said, had some career history with uh, sort of contributing songs to existing work and, and, and writing individual music, but with this, this material just really clicked with him. He had a way about writing for burlesque and writing for vaudeville anyway. A lot of big band experience for a show that required a big orchestra. It was really a match made in heaven there. And Mr. Sondheim had no problem uh, working with him on this production. Uh, Gypsy, as I said, covers the life of Gypsy Rose Lee. And in some respects, it's sort of a meditation on the idea that we sort of live vicariously through our children and whether that's a wise thing to do or not. Many people have looked at it as sort of a scathing indictment of the way that uh, Ms. Lee's mother treated her. Other people take a more sympathetic view and say that her mother had only the best intentions and that she was not really you know, repaid properly for her efforts. Um, Mama Rose is determined that her children are gonna become famous and, and as such, she is taking them to a variety of those czar center of vaudeville auditions that we spoke of earlier in class and trying them over and over again and, and she has a little act put together particularly featuring the woman that's going to be at the center of the act her daughter not lee not louise but uh june but mama rose has two daughters louise who would eventually be called lee as sort of a nickname and june by the way june have these are real people and this is a true story uh june havoc you might have seen her in the most bizarre place if you've seen the very old 1960s film, The uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. When the creature is carrying a girl out of the water, all limp in his two arms, that is June Havoc. And that was her big role that she ran away uh, from her family to, to take on. But I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of the story. You see, Mama Rose is convinced that June is her and the family's future. And she has her doing an act that's a little puerile. It kind of revolves around the song Let Me Entertain You at Times, and she does cartwheels and wears a wig with banana curls and sort of looks like Shirley Temple and says things like, my name's June and what's yours? And she sort of tries to explain to her mother and says, mom, I'm, I'm you know, what, 18, 19 years old. This is getting a little embarrassing that you've got me out here doing splits and cartwheels. And she says, no, nope, you're my little girl. You're not, gonna, you're not too old for this. And it's gonna make us all famous. Well, after trying that for a long, long time, June realizes that it's just not for her and that her mother is just not a person that she can handle being controlled by, and she elopes with another young man from their sort of traveling theater troupe and runs away to California. And Mama, not to be deterred, immediately, rather than give up her dream of having a kid on the stage, kind of sees in the corner Louise, her other daughter, who is a tomboy, who does not particularly creative the spotlight, who's a, an introvert, who collects stuffed animals and loves animals of all kinds, and is shy beyond belief, and her mother says, nope, you'll be fine, you'll be great, just like the song says, and everything's coming up roses, and sort of shoves her on the stage anyway, and says, nope, you're gonna be an actress. And the sort of subtle and twisted and bizarre way that Louise kind of gets her revenge on her mother Louise and many other people in the act also see something that the mother just kind of refuses to see. They see that vaudeville is dying, and that particularly these family acts, these kids singing and this sort of thing is going out of style, and that there's really no place for that. Mama Rose doesn't see that either. And Mama Rose doesn't see that it's being replaced in almost every case by burlesque, by uh, women at least telling dirty jokes and taking their clothes partially off and doing suggestive dances and playing not so much to families anymore but just to businessmen in their uh, lunch break and after work crowd. And Louise decides, well, you wanted an actress? I'll give you an actress and I'll do what I can to kind of get my revenge on you by making my act extraordinarily suggestive 
and by taking off at least a lot of my clothes and by telling all sorts of really rude jokes. And because she's attractive, she is an overhead sensation. She gets to the point where she becomes so famous that she doesn't need her mother to come and visit her in her dressing room any longer. And she's moved beyond that and, and asks that her mother be removed from her, from her life, at least for a time. Um, Mama kind of has a nervous breakdown, and in one of the most famous um, musical theater soliloquies ever written, uh, performs a roughly seven minute monologue slash song titled Mama's Turn, where, you know, she completely loses her mind and, and, and complains about how when you're a, a parent and suddenly your life is full of, as she says, scrapbooks full of you in the background. And where does it get you if you work this hard to put your child forward? In the film version of Gypsy, which came out in the early 1960s, um, an attempt was made to sort of soften it a little bit because the last shot of the film is Louise sort of seeing her mother having this breakdown and putting an arm around her and they presumably going to walk off and have a better relationship. But um, the show itself, in many respects, can be a very, very dark and brooding piece. It doesn't always have to be that way, but it has kind of developed in that direction. Another important thing about Gypsy is that it gives us um, one of the most famous overtures in the American musical theater. And this is as good a moment as any to explain to you a little bit of the function of an overture. Now, when you hear an overture, first of all, just in case you're not sure, an overture itself is an extended instrumental medley of the music that we're going to hear in the show that is played exclusively by the orchestra with no actors on stage at the beginning of the show. At the very opening of the show, before the show starts, you may have experienced this at some point, um, especially in some of these older shows, the band comes out, they play a good five minutes of all the songs that are featured in the show. Now why? Among other things, in shows that were new, that could not rely on the familiarity, remember the idea of the jukebox musical is many years off, so um, these shows kind of require uh, a chance for you to hear the tune and become familiar with it early. Later, in a revival or a show that you've seen before, it's a great opportunity to kind of subtly tell the audience, well, these songs are in the show, and you go, oh yeah, I'm gonna hear that song tonight, or something like that. For community theaters and, and school groups and that sort of thing, frankly, it's also a moment for the orchestra, completely devoid of and separate from the cast. And it gives the orchestra a chance, you know, if your son or daughter is playing the oboe, or is, you know, even conducting the band, this is the chance where the spotlight is almost exclusively on the band. Uh, overtures also set the tone. They set the, mo the mood for what we're about to see. If an overture is a dark, brooding piece, then you're going to get this blah, blah, dark and serious thing. With Gypsy, you get a, a variety of colors and flavors, but mostly you get this real sense of an almost cinematic event level moment where the full orchestra is put into use. Uh, by the way, the overture from Gypsy is one of the things I'll be putting on as a link to this lecture. And it, you know, it kind of sets, sets, us, sets us up for what we're going to hear and tells us, oh, this is a big deal. Um, the Overture to Gypsy is considered by almost every theater critic as the gold standard against which other overtures are compared. And it got to the point with overtures, especially after the Gypsy one in 1959, that other musicals would almost by default have an, have an overture. And then eventually, when shows started to come out without one, um, that was notable, you know? By the time a, a series of other productions would come out and this, a character would just stroll out on stage and talk, audiences would be like, wow, that's novel. Because that's how prevalent the overture became, especially in the 1960s. Um, it's to this day, I think, a judgment call for a lot of directors of musicals. So we're going to cut the overture and just get right to the action. And in some cases, I think it makes more sense than others. But very often, I feel that, that an overture is required because it's designed to tell you, especially if you're new to this show, what to expect. So there's a little hint because, well, if, if we're gonna do another quiz, it's pretty likely that asking you a question about what an overture is for and, and then, yeah, the functions of the overture, is, there they are. So feel free to look back over that. Um, a series of actresses have successfully played Mama Rose, among them Angela Lansbury, Ty Daly, Beth Midler, uh, Bernadette Peters, Patty Lapone. Uh, many of them look back to the Ethel Merman version 
Um, I believe for some people in the late 50s, this might have been a discovery that Ethel was more than a very big and powerful voice, and that she herself could act, and that she could do uh, vulnerable and serious moments, because up until that point, she had done very broad musical comedy with things like Annie Get Your Gun and that sort of thing. And this was a, a real turning point. It became a signature show, and, and Everything's Coming Up Roses became a signature song uh, for her. Um, there are other uh, Julie Stein pieces that are notable, such as Funny Girl a few years later, which was a dramatization of the life of Fanny Bryce, a, uh, a, a vaudevillian. I think Stein was returning to this vaudeville slash burlesque world because he had had such success with it. Uh, Funny Girl became a tremendous success, particularly for an actress you know, a singer you know named Barbara Streisand. Um, and it, you know, it kind of carried Stein into a place from doing old-fashioned music to a little bit more, I don't want to say modern, because he's always had that sort of orchestral, show tune sound, but certainly, again, with some slightly more mature um, subject matter. Uh, toward the end of his career, um, Stein invested in something called uh, Freedom Land USA. This was to have been a theme park in, in New York City that was going to feature rides that would help tell all aspects of American history. It was going to be an underground railroad ride, and it was going to be a, a ride about a battle at Gettysburg. And, and they hired Stein to write music to go for the background of all of these rides. I guess they didn't take the winter into account because after one year, uh, Freedom Land USA completely went belly up and largely due to the cost of snow removal and cleanup to get it ready for another tourist season. And uh, Mr. Stein and a lot of other people lost a lot of money. And the place where that is is now a, a place called Co-op City, which is a condominium and parking lot right in the middle of the Bronx in New York. Uh, Mr. Stein uh, died of a heart attack in 1994. Um, he had received, at that point, several Lifetime Achievement Awards and would always probably known as the comp be known as the composer of Gypsy, but has, unlike some of these other guys, a, a real strong career with a lot of other shows as well that are equally as, as sophisticated. Uh, with our next section, we'll talk about Frank Lesser for a bit, and that'll be everything in this module, so thank you for sticking with us so far, and I'll see you in just the next part.